book of Philippians, we're going to stand for the reading of the Word or remain standing for the reading of the Word of God. I, I got here to the Potter's house this morning, early this morning, because I intended to. I wore what I wore as laid out last night. I didn't wake up this morning trying to figure out what I was going to put on. I like all of that stuff out of the way so I don't get up in a haphazard way. I have a strategy, I have a plan. I know where I want to go and so I was intentional. I didn't go joyriding in the car this morning to see where I might end up at. It's some beautiful sights to see, but when I got in the car this morning, I ended up at the Potter's house because I was intentional. And yet, many times in the most important areas of our lives, we live it without intention. turning it completely over to God to work it out as if we had no responsibility to be co-laborers with him. Well, if the Lord means for it to happen, if it be the Lord's will, I'll see you next Friday. If the Lord wanted me to have it, he would give it to me. He must not think I'm ready for it yet. We don't understand intentionality. And yet we have a God who is quite intentional. He's intentional. You are here because he intended. You understand? He's intentional. And so, I guess you know now, I'm going to be talking about intentionality. And I'm going to talk about it from Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 16. I'm going to be reading it out of the NIV. So you follow along in whatever translation you got, or we're going to sound like the day of Pentecost. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss, everything, everything, everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Oh my. He's so valuable that he made everything else look cheap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Good God of mercy. Did you hear that? The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in death. In the way, wait, 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 isn't that something to want? I want to know the power of his resurrection and the participation and the participation in his sufferings. There are some things you can only learn about God. through suffering. So all of you why me people, you, if, if you're going to escape, you better go right now because I'm getting ready to mess with your theology. It's not supposed to happen to me. I'm a Christian. I'm better than this. No, no, no. There are certain classes that you can only take in the classroom of suffering. You'll never be seasoned if you've never suffered. Becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining 
to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained. I'm, 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 I'm talking one place, but I'm living somewhere else. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to jive you. I don't want to blow your mind. I don't want to play games with you. I have not already obtained all of this or have already arrived. I haven't, I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived, but I do have a goal. I, I may not be there yet, but I have a goal. I'm, I'm not just fighting as one beats the air. I got a goal. Don't let the fact that I haven't obtained or haven't already arrived make you think that I don't have a goal. I have a specific intentional goal. And because I have a goal, I press. I press on to take hold. I, I, I want to, I want to, I'm trying to grip that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Yeah. I'm trying to grip it. Yeah. I'm trying to grip it. Help. It's gripped me. Woo. I'm trying to grip it. Yeah. Oh, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I, 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 I haven't fully gotten a grip on what's gotten a grip on me, but I, uh, one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and <laughs> forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Oh God, straining toward what is ahead. I'm not. Wait, 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 wait. I'm not just. I'm not just chilling. I'm straining. I'm not even just reaching. I'm straining toward that which is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature to, should take such a view of things. All mature people should be intentional. <laughs> Children wake up in the morning and don't have a strategy. But all mature people should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. That's a good word, isn't it? Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Don't be so busy snatching after what's next that you don't acknowledge what you got right now. There's certain things that, that I have already attained. Now there's other things that I'm straining toward, but, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. But there are some things I got up under my belt right now. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Remain standing, I'm gonna pray with you about being intentional. I'm gonna pray with you about being Intentional. Really, I'm going to pray with you about being like Jesus. Because he is intentional. The cross was intentional. <laughs> the grave was intentional. The resurrection was intentional. Living your life right on schedule has got to be the best feeling in the world. I am right where I'm supposed to be doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. That's a good thing. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we humbly crawl toward your throne on bended knees and bowed down heads, hoping that your blood would fall on us and saturate us and cleanse us and that you would prepare us to enter beyond the outer courts and the outer parameters of childish thinking, but that you would take us into the intimate place of your tent so that we can sup with you. We're gonna sit at the table with you and break bread with you over the next few minutes. And if we are lucky somewhere behind the veil, we will be enraptured in your presence because it is you alone that we seek. 
and everything else seems worthless beside you. Your presence cheapens my highest pursuit. For if I attain it without you, I have got the cheapest part of your essence. Nothing compares. It all looks like garbage in contrast to having you. I thank you for what you're going to do. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Yeah. Our God is intentional. He is not accidental. He is not happenstance. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't react. He acts. He's sovereign. He sits on the circle of the earth, the place of change, position of power. Heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. He's the boss of every dominion. He's the CEO of the universe. He's the president of glory. He is the auspicious one, the all-sufficient one, the God that is more than enough. He is the kind of God that does not need us to tell him that he's God to be God. He doesn't need us to volunteer to campaign for him. He was God before we were there to say he was God. He doesn't suffer from low self-esteem and need us to come along and tell him who he is. He knew who he was before we knew who we were. He is God all by himself. He has never been worried. God has never been worried. God has never been shocked. He determines the end from the beginning and then works all things after the counsel of his own will. God has determined where you're going to end up before you were ever born. He says to one prophet, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, I ordained thee, and I sanctified thee to be a prophet unto the nation. I didn't wait till you got here and then look at you and see what kind of gifts you got and try to figure out a position for you. I birthed you with intentionality for you to fit a particular spot. Nobody can fit your spot like you do. I designed you for that spot. I gave you everything you need to function in that spot. How dare you think you're not enough? Come on. When you think you're not enough, you're saying, I didn't plan well enough. You are enough for your assignment. And if you're not enough for what you're doing, you got the wrong assignment. Because everything I intended you to do, I equipped you to do. So you can admire other people's gifts, but never be jealous of them, because if you needed what they had, I would give you what they had. I gave you everything you need to do what you've got to do. You must understand then that God is intentional and we are created in the likeness of an intentional God, thereby our greatest defense is not our legs like the hyenas running or the wings of an eagle that spread out or the eyes of an eagle that are given to it as defense or the roar of a lion. No, our greatest defense is our mind, our brain. Our legs are not fast, our arms do not fly. We can't lift up out of the ground without building something to fly in. The thing that gives us our defense is how we think. And if there were anything up under attack, it is how we think. That's where the battleground is, is in your mind. That's where the enemy wants to confuse you with different voices and different ideas is in your head because he knows your greatest weapon is your mind. Sisters, not your mouth. I know there are a lot of books out there that says your tongue is your weapon. Your mind is your weapon. Your mind is your weapon. So winning the argument doesn't move the agenda forward because it is possible to win the argument and lose the war. So when you are insecure, you don't retaliate by talking, but by thinking. Yes. 
For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I'm going to think my way out. I'm going to think my way out. I'm going to think my way out because I'm starting to understand that God is intentional. When we look at our text today, we're not just listening at the writings and the murmurings of some itinerant preacher or some evangelist who has come into town to speak to the Philippian church. We are looking at the one that God used to push out of his womb the Philippian church. He has birthed it himself. He has an attachment to it. There's something about your children that will get your attention quicker than anything else. Good or bad, they determine your mood sometimes. Because when you have birthed something, you can't help caring about it. You can say, I don't care. It doesn't make me any difference. You do whatever you want to do. <laughs> but you're still going to be looking out that window saying, are they home yet? Did they get in the house yet? Yeah, because, because when you birth something, you have a special level of passion about it. Especially how God used Paul as a conduit to birth the church at Philippi. It was not that God brought him into the city just to do great preaching, because preaching was not the platform that shook the city. He did some of that, but that's not what shook the city. He just preached enough to get on enough powerful people's nerves to get him arrested. So it was not his preaching that converted the city. It was him being arrested. Wow. Wow. God created prison as a platform for purpose. Right? He willed him into jail intentionally. God could have stopped the arrest. Sometimes God doesn't stop trouble because trouble is the platform whereby he shows himself strong. God said, I'm going to use you getting beaten and locked up in a way that I could not use your preaching or your writing or your intellectualism. I need a platform big enough that the wealthy people are talking about you because they had you arrested. The elected officials are talking about you because they executed the arrest. And the carnal criminals are talking about you because I'm going to put you in jail right with them. And I put you in jail to show off. I put you in jail and I watch, I let you get arrested. I let you get beaten in front of everybody. I let you come down to absolutely nothing. I let them drag your bloody striped body into a jail cell so that everybody could be sure that you were locked away in an inner sanctum, in an impossible situation, in a place from which you could not escape with chains around your feet and chains around your hands because you prayed and asked me to use you. So, so I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. There's a lady in the hospital I want you to meet. And so I'm going to bring you in with chest pains in an ambulance just so that you can be across the hallway. Uh, y'all can't, y'all, 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 y'all can't, y'all can't understand how God sets things up. The big word I want to use, the first big word I want to use is exposure. God put Paul in prison to expose Philippi to the gospel. In other words, God creates problems so that he can get the glory out of solving them. In other words, God lets Lazarus die just so he can raise him from the dead. Yes. 
In other words, God lets the blind man be born blind so that at the right time he can heal his blindness and get the glory. His mother didn't sin. His father didn't sin. I willed him to be blind because when the time is right, the way I bring him out is going to give me glory. So just sit still and wait on me. I'm using the trouble to expose Philippi to my ministry. Now, you can only embrace this if you can get past your narcissism. And narcissism today is a hard wall to knock down. You can only embrace this when you begin to understand that everything you go through is not about you. You can only embrace this when you begin to understand that God is not a stewardess to make sure that you are comfortable and that your peanuts are warmed. He is not as interested in your comfort. He's interested in maneuvering you into a position of intentionality so that he can work out his will in your life and he will use both your blessings and your sorrow to prove himself strong in your life so that he can get the glory out of your life. He will will you to come down to a Red Sea you can't get around, block you in on every side, blow back the Red Sea just so your Pharaoh can see that your God is bigger than your Pharaoh and he will let your Pharaoh drown in the afterthoughts of your God. Nudge your neighbor and say it's a setup. God uses Paul's and Silas' time in jail as a stage. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and suddenly there was an earthquake and a great shaking, and the doors of the prison were open, and all the bound were loosed, and yet nobody left. If God blew up the prison, <laughs> broke loose the chains, open up the doors, and everybody in the prison is like, yo, <laughs> chill. We are still here. Why are you still here if God blew up the prison for you to escape? So escape must not be success. Because if escape was success, if escape was success, we'd be gone. I want to talk to all of you people who have been praying, Lord, get me out of this. Just get me out. I don't care what you do. I don't care how you do it. Have you ever considered that sometimes God puts you in it for something bigger than your comfort? And if you stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, that God is going to get some glory out of this. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God is going to get some glory out of this. I like exposure in my own life. I've learned that exposure is transformative. That we think the way that we think about things because of what we have or have not been exposed to. I certainly have to remember that when I get on Twitter. Yeah, because as you deal with people who say obnoxious things, you have to consider that what they say is a result of what they think, and what they think is a result of what they've been exposed to. And everything they say, you don't have to answer. Time will answer for you. If they keep on living and get some opportunities to be exposed to something other than the people that they are around, they'll go to the next level because your, your ideology is affected by those with who you associate with. And whenever God gets ready to change your life, the first thing he says to you, Abram, get away from your country and everything that's kin to what you used to be because I'm getting ready to do something that you can't relate to and your relatives are holding you back. 
I want to break the system that stops you from being able to go to the next level by exposing you to something else, and you got to be willing to let go of them to go to the next level because you think like them. And you dress like them, and you act like them, and you vote like them, and you walk like them, and you talk like them, but you are not them. Exposure is transformative. You, you, you don't have to own it. Just be exposed to it. Once you're exposed to something, it changes everything. It changes the possibilities. It changes the potential. Just exposure. That's how the children of the Hebrew children took over the promised land after years of wandering around in the wilderness. God exposed them to the promised land before he gave them the promised land. He exposed them to it. He sent spies over there to get a taste of it and then said, what I'm allowing you to taste today, I'm going to give you tomorrow. I don't know who this is for. But God is exposing you to something. And you feel kind of funny and out of place right now. But what he's exposing you to, he's about to release in your life. And God exposed the Philippians to the gospel of Jesus Christ by blowing up the prison, opening up all the doors, breaking all the chains, and finding Paul in there talking about, I'm cool with it. Because I understand this prison is not about me. Do you understand that your prison is not about you? Do you understand that your prison could be your platform? That creates a platform through which you can have influence with people that you couldn't have influence with if you had not gone through similar experiences with them. that God often transforms us only after he has exposed us. Exposure is a powerful thing. In, in, in sociological situations, we have come to understand that if you put a whole bunch of poor people together, the neighborhood, no matter how you fix it up, will always go down. Society teaches us that mixed income housing stabilizes people because mixed income housing puts poor people and uneducated people in an environment that you live across the street from somebody who went to school and they make it look sexy and they make it look good and they make it look possible and they make it look attainable. If you don't see it, you can't be it. But if you can see it, you can become it. Exposure is, oh y'all don't hear me. It's the impetus to everything. It's not enough to talk to me about education if you don't expose me to educated people. Offering me an education I don't have an appetite for will make me drop out of school. But when the people across the street went to school, and when the people over there did this, and the people over there did that, it becomes possible. because I'm exposed to it. And the whole city was transformed just because God used the prison to expose the gospel. Fear not, do thyself no harm. The jailer comes in, he's ready to kill himself. Paul says, chill, don't kill yourself. We're all here. We have not escaped. I'm not leaving this place until I get what God intended. Tell death, I'm not leaving this place until I get what God intended. Tell them people who hate you on your job, I am not leaving this place until I get what God intended. Tell those people who are trying to get you to drop out of school, I'm not leaving this place until I get what God intended. I am not leaving this city until I accomplish what God sent me here to do. I am not going to quit preaching this sermon until I accomplish what God sent me here to do. I'm going to stand right here, get right up in your face, and tell you what he said until I get accomplished 
what he's trying to do because I'm living in his intention. I'm breathing in his intention. I'm moving in his intention. I'm protected in his intention. He will sustain me as long as I focus on what he intended. He will make everything work out for the good of them that love the Lord who are the called according to his purpose, which is intentions. So the safest place in the whole wide world for me to be is in his intentions. He is a searcher and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. Why would God search our intentions while people talk about our actions? Oh, they didn't, they didn't get that. You got that. I saw that when they hit your head. They talk about my actions, but God's Word searches my intentions because my intentions are more powerful than my actions. There is a gulf between my intentions and my actions. While man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart because the heart holds what I intended to be while people talk about what I did. God judges me by what I meant. I meant to be a good father. I meant to be a good mother. I meant to be a good husband. I meant to be a good member. I meant to keep my word. I meant to be on time. I meant to stand up to this test. I meant to do it. I might stumble. I might fall short. I may not have attained it, but I'm snatching after it. I'm straining after it. I'm reaching after it. I'm falling down and getting back up again. Because I am where I am going through what I'm going through intentionally. So I might as well calm down, and I might as well stop being restless, and I might as well stop murmuring and complaining, and I might as well stop kicking and squirming, begging to get out of some place that God went through all kind of trouble to get me in. <laughs> A lot of times you like people till you meet them. <laughs> the idea of them is better than the reality of them. And you might admire them because of what you saw them do or what you, what you heard about them or what you read about them. And then when you meet them, you find out they're not nearly as nice as, as what you thought because exposure dispels myths. <laughs> You understand what I'm talking about? Exposure is important. All my parents in here make some noise. It's nice when you can give your kids the best of everything. It's nice when you can send them to the best schools. It's nice if you can buy them the best clothes. But if you can just expose them, if they can visit it, if they can taste it, if they can walk in the room, if you can go to the restaurant and just have dessert, exposing people to the next level lets them know that it's possible to go to the next level. God used Paul's situation to expose Philippi to a whole new radical idea about Jesus Christ and the first church started in a prison <laughs> good God of mercy exposure all of them got saved all of them got delivered through what Paul suffers it is to that Philippi that he writes I'm gonna share another big word with you when you begin to understand the power of being exposed. The next thing that I want you to get out of this text is the word experience. Because exposure brought about an experience. Because Paul was in the prison, they had an experience with God. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in the prison, been in the prison for months or years, everything's normal, another every day looks like the day before when you're in jail, you don't know whether it's Wednesday or Monday. 
because the routine is still the same every day. Everything is just normal. No big shocks, no big waves, no big noise. And all of a sudden, there is an earthquake and angels are shaking on the rooftop and all the doors are open up and they had an undeniable experience with God. That's what we don't have today. We have an experience with church, but we don't have an experience with God. If you have an experience with God, you wouldn't be Christian today and Muslim tomorrow and serving God today and now you're over here with this group over here and you move this way and you move that way and whoever talks to you, that's what you think this week. But once you've had a real experience with God, you don't need to speak Greek or Hebrew to know that he opened up the doors for me. He broke my chain. He delivered me. He set me free. He healed my body. He brought me through a storm. He delivered my soul. He blessed me when I wasn't worthy. I know that I know that I know. They asked the blind man, they said, who is this man that healed you? Why did he heal you? When he, he said, I don't know nothing about that. I don't know nothing about who he is. I don't know nothing about what he should have done on the cellar. All I know is that I once was blind. That's all I know. I'm wondering if there's anybody in this room that's had an experience with God. I said, I'm wondering if there's anybody in this room that's had an undeniable experience with God. An experience is something that no one can take away from you. I don't care how you laugh, I don't care how you talk, you cannot take away what I know that I know that he did in my life. I know he did that. I know he did that. I know he did that. Touch three people say I had an experience with God. I had an experience with God. I had an experience with God. I'm here to be a witness. I had an experience with God. I had an experience with God. Clap your hands and give God a praise right now. I said somebody that had an experience with God, clap your hands and give him a praise right now. I had an experience with God. I'm not ashamed to tell you I had an experience with God. It might not have even been at church, but I had an experience with God. It might have been in my bedroom, but I had an experience with God. It might have been in the hospital, but I had an experience with God. I mean, I know God did this for me. I couldn't do this for myself. Mama didn't do it. Daddy didn't do it. God had to do this. If you know what I'm talking about, make some noise. Oh my God. Oh my God. I had an experience with God. He woke me up in the middle of the night. I had an experience with God. He brought me through something, Jan, that I know I couldn't have got through on my own. I didn't have the strength. I didn't have the resources. I didn't have the contacts. And then all of a sudden, God just opened up a way and made a way out of no way. I had an experience with God. I was on the verge of losing my mind, and I had an experience with God. I almost killed myself, but I had an experience with God. Some of you had it in the prison. Some of you had it in the courtroom. Some of you had it in the boardroom. Some of you had it in the hospital. But you had an experience.
See, we, we don't do church like we used to do church. We, we used to wait around the altar until we had an experience with God. Now we're so busy being cute that we never really get down to have an experience with God because it might mess up my tie and it might mess up my shirt. But every now and then you ought to rip off everything and just... Ain't no way in the world I'm supposed to be standing here. It didn't look like, my trajectory didn't look like I would end up right here. It didn't look like I would end up right here, born on the side of a mountain in the hills of West Virginia, eating government cheese and, and eggs that came out of can with black writing on them. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, dry powdered milk that it milked and put it in the refrigerator. Ain't no way I'm supposed to be raised off of government cheese and standing where I'm standing right now. My mama wasn't famous. My daddy wasn't famous. My uncles and aunts weren't famous. My grandparents were sharecroppers. Ain't no way in the world I'm supposed to be standing where I am right now. But when you have an experience with God, God has a way of taking you places you've never been and showing your sight. I want to talk to some people that where you are right now does not fit your background. Make some noise. Where I am right now doesn't fit my background. It doesn't fit my situation. I should have been locked up. I should have threw in the towel. I should have had a nervous breakdown. But I had an experience with God. That experience with God was so radical that they started a church in a jail cell. You don't have to have stained glass windows. You don't need padded pews. You don't need expensive equipment. All you need is a real experience with God. It'll turn your living room into a prayer room. It'll turn your dishwasher into an altar. When you've had an experience with God, Sit with me. Give me a minute. I'm almost finished. I got one more big word. Yeah. Yeah. The experience with God is what calls me to the next level. I called you. I called you. I snatched you out for a reason. You're here for a purpose. I got a plan for your life. I'm sorry I disappointed you. I'm sorry your dream didn't come true. But I sacrificed your dream because I had a better dream for you than what you had for yourself. And if you trust me, you're going to end up better than you were in the first place because I'm God and I can outthink you. So I'm going to let you cry today so you can dance tomorrow. But don't worry about it. We may, may endure for a night, but I want to talk to some people who had your plans wrecked. And you don't understand where you are. God has a better plan. Go a little deeper. I call you. Yeah. Yeah. I called you up. No matter who tried to put their foot on you, I called you up. No matter who said you weren't qualified, I called you up. No matter who laughed at your dream, I called you up. I called you 
I called you, I called you. It was yours before you got there. It was yours before you moved in. I saved it for you. My God, I feel like preaching this morning. I want to talk to some people who think you lost some stuff. You've been fishing all night and ain't caught nothing. And God wanted you to have an experience with him. But nothing that you need is going to be lost. The fish are still on the other side of the boat. If you wait on him, he's going to give you back double for your trouble. Shout yes! So let me show you this. Let me show you this. I got to get to the point. Yeah. I'm trying to hurry, but y'all keep shouting. I'm trying to hurry, but y'all keep dancing. I'm trying to hurry, but chains keep falling off. I'm trying to hurry, but doors keep opening up. I'm trying to hurry, but the bound are getting loose. I'm trying to hurry, but the sick are being healed. Glory! Because you see, Benny, none of, none, of, none of what I said is my point. My point is, number three is evolution. The process that comes after the experience of becoming what he called me to. See, he, he will call you something on credit. He will call you the head while you feel like the tail. He will call you above while all kind of stuff is over top of you. He will call you a conqueror at the weakest moment in your life. The call is the conflict. The call is the conflict because it is the call that makes you grapple with becoming what he called you. In 30 minutes, I can perform a wedding. They can put a ring on your finger. I can pronounce you husband and wife. In 30 minutes, but it'll take you 30 years to be one. Oh, y'all don't want to hear that. Y'all don't want to hear that. You don't, you're not a wife because you wore a white dress and you got your hair done. What are y'all saying? You snatched? I don't care how snatched you are. You're a wife when you run out of money and you still make a home. You're a wife when you're backed in a corner and you're shoved to the wall and you work through problems. You're a wife when you feel like leaving but you don't leave. You're a wife when you put the priorities of others above yourself. You're a husband when you don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to work. You do what you got to do. It takes you a while to become what they call you. Just because you got a degree don't make you a teacher. Just because you got a desk in a classroom don't make you a teacher. Just because you sit in a big office don't make you a boss. The conflict is in becoming what they call you. I count not myself. Don't get it twisted. I am not there yet. That's why I get away from all the church people who try to tell me how much they are there. Because if the guy who wrote the book, if the guy who wrote the book says, I want to tell y'all something, I'm still working on this. Then don't tell me you read the book and you leaped ahead of the one who wrote the book. 
Paul says, I count not myself to have apprehended. I'm trying to snatch what snatched me. Look, one of them is over. Oh, that I may apprehend that which I am apprehended of. That which I am apprehended of is done. And I'm still trying to grasp what's done. That's where I want to spend my last few minutes with you. It's, it's the, the struggle is to grasp what he's done. The, the strain, faith is, the strain is to, is to stretch yourself far enough to close the gap between who he says you are and how you see yourself. That's the struggle. That's the wrestling match. To, I, 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 he snatched me. And, and I'm still trying to grasp what he's done. I'm still trying to grasp it in my spirit. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. I'm pressing toward it, but there's still some distance. He's got me in a way that I, I haven't quite grasped him. Help me, Lord. Somebody was walking me through, and we were looking at pictures of uh, Megafest. And they said, that must have been an amazing moment for you. And I said, just tell me what it felt like. I said, it felt like hell. <laughs> Traffic was backed up everywhere. Had to have police escorts to get in the building. Over a hundred some thousand people in the venue every night. Fire marshal about to shut us down. Three venues filled to capacity. 10,000 children under 12. It felt like hell. It felt nauseating. Budget was $10 million. Have to reach it in a weekend. It felt like hell. Feels good now. <laughs> but while I'm stretching and straining and pulling and reaching and wondering, can I do it? And do I have what it takes? And can I make it through this alive? It never feels good. People who feel good too soon are arrogant. They are arrogant. They are foolish. In the time of strain, nothing feels good. But after you suffered a while, God said, I'll. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You ain't married the first year. You're mad the first year. Maybe I made a mistake. This joker is crazy. He's sloppy. She's messy. Her mouth gets on my nerves. You're not married the first year. You ain't seen me sick yet. You ain't seen me broke yet. You ain't seen me hurt yet. You haven't seen me depressed yet. You haven't seen me bury my loved ones yet. Every time you go through something, you strain a little closer toward becoming what God called you to be. It takes time and sweat and blood and tears. And finally you say, you're my wife. You're my wife for life. 
You don't know that in 30 minutes. You don't know you a mama till your child is in trouble. You don't know what it means to be a mother until somebody attacks your child. And you don't care whether your makeup is on or not, or whether your wig is cockeyed on your head and you're driving down the street with your wig on backwards saying, you must be out of your mind. Where are my mamas in the house make some noise? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean real mamas, not people who just had a baby. I mean real mamas make some noise. Well, I, oh my God, I need some real mamas. You say this. This evolution is what Paul is talking about. This stretching, this stretching process, this painful stretching process of grasping what has grasped you, of receiving what has received you. We did the, we did the consecration last Sunday and consecrated two new pastors and I asked, and it was an amazing service, it was beautiful. And I didn't get to talk to Dr. Anifis as much as I did uh, Pastor Vinchard, but I kept asking him. He said, I, I can't, uh, I don't, I can't put it in the words. What happened? I, I, I don't know what to say. I can't process it yet. You can't process it yet. The, the service is over, but I'm still trying to grasp what was that? What happened? What just happened in my life. That's why God doesn't talk to you every day. God went seven and ten year intervals without speaking to Abram because when God speaks to you, it blows your mind and it takes you years to grasp what he said and walk into what he called you to be. You don't do that in 30 minutes. You don't do that and put it on Snapchat. You don't do that and put it on Facebook. It takes you years to understand and become and all that I may apprehend. That which I'm apprehended of. God brought Jacob up to the mountaintop and told him, I know you spent your whole life being called Jacob, which means trickster or con artist or scam man. But God said, you are a prince and your real name is Israel. And they wrestled, they wrestled because this is a wrestling match to find out who you really are, to find out what you can really do to find out what you can really reach. It's a wrestling match. It's not a degree. It's not a salary. It's not a car. It's not a brand name clothes. It's not stuff. It's not things. That's why Paul said, I count all the things as garbage. It is not things. You can wear labels that don't make you any more or any less than what you were before you had them all because God said, I'll make your name great. And it takes you a while to understand who you are. Can you grasp it? I apologize to all the people in the room who are interested or called to go anywhere. This message must be boring you to tears because the only people I want to talk to who have this are the people who have this nagging, gnawing feeling that there's something else inside of me other than where I'm at right now and it does not yet appear what I shall be. I might not look like it right now. I might not have it right now. I might not preach like that now. I may not minister like that. I may not drive like that. I may not have the office, but there's something pulling at me. There's something that snatched me. There's something that won't let me rest where I am. Who am I preaching to? Throw your hands up and say, I want it! 
I want it. I want it so bad I'm willing to strain. I'm willing to stretch. I'm willing to crawl. I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to go through hell. I'm willing to have delayed gratification. I'm willing to be lonely. I'm willing to cry myself to sleep. I'm willing to wipe my own tears out of my own eyes. I want it. I want it. I cannot die wondering what I could have been, what I should have been, what I was meant to be, what I should have done. The devil is a lie. I've got a feeling that there's something that's pulling me. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. Touch your neighbor and say, excuse me. Get out of my way. I press. I press. I ain't got time to be in your face. I press. 30 seconds of crazy praise. Chosen people over here. Are there any called people over there? I press, I press, I crawl, I slide, I moan, I groan, I strain. God told Jacob, you're a prince. Your real name is Israel. You have prevailed with God. And all the rest of his life, the same man is referred to by two different names. <laughs> You, you hear me? So, sometime in the same paragraph, it'll call him Jacob one minute and Israel the next. I'm talking about the schizophrenia of becoming. Of being stuck between where I am and where I'm trying to go. And sometimes I act like where I am. And sometimes I act like where I'm trying to go. So I'm Jacob one minute and I'm Israel the next. Where are the real people at? Isn't it crazy how you can have faith about something and be scared to death about something else? Isn't it crazy how you can be courageous in one area and be so nervous that your lips are trembling in the next moment? I'm after it. I'm after it. If he says I'm a prince, I'm after it. All my life I thought I was a con like my mama and them, <laughs> like my uncle and them like my relatives, like my background, like my background, like where I came from. This is for Jacob, a behavior that runs through his family. He comes from a lineage of tricksters. His mama was slick. Her uncle Laban was slick. They all slick. Jacob didn't get this slickness by himself. He got it from his background. He got it from his neighborhood. He got it from where he came from. But he's trying to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of becoming a prince. How do princes think? How do princes dress? How do princes act? How do princes respond? Because sometimes I'm responding as Jacob. when I need to be responding like Israel. And sometimes I messed up and I gave somebody Jacob's phone number. <laughs> Have you ever given somebody Jacob's number? And, and all of a sudden they know how to access your Jacob. 
They know how to call up your Jacob. They know how to ring up. They know how to text your Jacob. Don't give anybody Jacob's phone number because they will call Jacob up. They will call Jacob out. They will bring out the they will bring out what you're trying to get rid of. I press. Until you start living your life with intention, you will never make great decisions. Because great decisions are based on intentionality. They're based on purpose. Great decisions are made when you decide, I am only going to make decisions that bring out the Israel and not the Jacob. When the Bible says forgetting those things which are behind, it is not talking about Alzheimer's. <laughs> it is talking about letting go of anything that contradicts your destiny. I'll make this confession and then I'll pray. I notice that I am the most comfortable around people who have the same history. People who have the same history, like the same foods, <laughs> have the same issues, use the same colloquialisms. They make me comfortable because I have history with them. People who I share destiny with I visit them, but I have trouble grasping that I'm really one of them because I have no history with them. I only have destiny with them. So my challenge is to become more comfortable with shared destiny than I am with shared history. Because as long as you keep connecting with people who have shared history, you will never go forward. The only way you can go forward is to hook up with people who have the same destiny and be willing to feel out of place in the room and be willing to be a little bit awkward and be willing to be out of your comfort zone and say, Lord, I trust you that you wouldn't have brought me in this room if I weren't enough to be in this room. And I thank you for teaching me how to grasp that which has grasped me. Oh, God. There are some people in this room, and I'm going to close with this. God is doing some things in your life that you are experiencing and you have been exposed to, and you are trying to evolve into it, but you're having trouble grasping it. And, and you, you can't. You can visit it but you can't grasp it because you have no point of reference for what God is trying to do in your life. And, and so you talk schizophrenic. Jacob one minute, Israel the next minute, Israel one minute, Jacob the next minute. I got this. I believe God. Everything's going to happen. The devil is alive. Oh, the blood prevails. I got this together. Oh, my God. If this don't come, the whole thing's going to come apart. We're going to lose the house. We're going to lose our mind. We're going to lose everything. I'm probably going to end up an alcoholic, living outside in the street somewhere, sleeping up under a bridge. I don't know what in the world's going to happen. Oh, I coughed. I must have AIDS. I don't know what this is. Oh, my hip is out of place. Oh, my mind. Oh, whose report do you believe? I believe the report of the Lord. I want to talk to some schizo people who are in a place right Right now that sometimes you talk faith and sometimes you talk fear and sometimes you feel like you got it and sometimes you're scared to death and sometimes you're ready to take the mountain and sometimes you feel like the mountain is on top of you where are my real people at make some noise I want to spend my last few minutes with you 
I want to tell you, first of all, you're not crazy. <laughs> you're not crazy. I want to tell you that winning doesn't feel like winning. I want to tell you that God will bring you into a place that you don't feel worthy of. And if you're not careful, you'll sabotage it just to have company with your kin. I want to tell you when God starts raising you up, people will resent you and say you're acting funny. And that means that you're not acting like where you came from. You're acting like where you're going. And they have an issue with you because you are becoming something bigger than how they define you. I had 10 members in a city with one red light. I pastored my church half the time from the piano, using my foot as a drum, leading the worship service in a mic, working eight hours a day and putting my check in the church to keep the doors open. But I kept having this sneaky feeling that there was more down inside of me than what my situation said that I was. And I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, by mind to that which was behind me, I strain toward that which is before me. I kept pressing. There's nothing wrong with having 10 members. There's nothing wrong with being in a storefront church if that is your purpose and that is your destiny. But it is asphyxiating to be stuck into something that is beneath what is calling you. It, has a, it is asphyxiating to be limited into a shell of what people think you ought to be. It is a prison to be incarcerated and stuck in the state they left you in. And that's why God is breaking chains this morning. Wait, 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 wait. The chains are not on your hands. They're not on your feet. Yeah, you got it. You're preaching good this morning. The chains are on your mind. And the Lord told me to tell you this morning that you're not going to get there by waiting and praying and believing God. And I know that's very unpopular to say to church people because we respond to everything by waiting and praying and believing God. God said you have to be intentional. God said you have to get up every morning and strain to think on the level of where he's calling you. To think yourself free. To think yourself well. To think yourself whole to think yourself into the next idiom of influence that God is getting ready to take you, that, you, that it's going to happen in your head before it happens in your life, that it's going to be in your intentions, it's going to be in your spirit, it's going to be in your mean to. I mean to. I mean to. I'm going after this.